Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I said, if you love Jesus, can you make some noise tonight? Let me hear you. Man, you look good. Turn to somebody, say you look good. Turn to your second choice, say you look gooder. <laughs> Man, it is such an honor to be at Res Youth. Do you love Res Youth? What a special, special place. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but what happens here at Res Youth is not normal. Hey, listen to me real quick. What happens here at Res Youth is not normal. This many students in a room for Jesus does not just happen. Okay, this is incredible. This is like the Michael Jordan of youth groups right here. This is the real deal. And you have the Michael Jordan of youth pastors in Pastor Landon, Pastor Connor, come on, Pastor Brooke, come on, do you love your youth pastors? Can you make some noise for your youth pastors tonight? Incredible, incredible youth pastors. Pastor Landon and I have been friends for a few months now, and uh, you literally stole what I was going to say about you. Uh, the smile, the authenticity, uh, I feel like I am closer to Jesus after every conversation, and uh, I'm excited for a lifetime of friendship. I'm excited to learn from you. I'm already learning from you, and uh, this is an honor to be with your students. Uh, I love you, man. It's an honor to be here. On your son's birthday, shout out to Arrow. Happy fifth birthday. Happy fifth birthday. Hey, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on. Turn them on for me. All right, turn them on. Unless you got an Android, leave it in your pocket. We don't want you disturbing the airwaves in here. All right, turn your Bible on. Can I introduce you to my family really quick? Can I introduce you to my family? All right, I got a photo of my wife. I've been married for two years and uh, been married to a girl named Madison Heron. This is Maddie, the most beautiful girl I have ever met inside and out. She's from Alabama, so she speaks with an accent. She says, y'all. Yeah. Anybody in the room you say y'all to? Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. That's my wife, Maddie, and um, she is just uh, my better half. She loves Jesus like nobody I've ever seen. We uh, are really excited because next time we get to hang out with Res Youth, we're going to have to bring... Uh, and, or we're going to have to buy an extra plane ticket because we just found out some pretty cool news uh, not too long ago. And that news is this photo right here. We just found out we're having a baby boy. A baby boy. And so... We are so excited. Our entire family is so excited. The only person in my family who's not excited is this guy right here. This is my son, my firstborn son. His name is Mowgli. His name is Mowgli. Now, he looks really cute, but I promise you it is not cute when he wakes me up at 4 o'clock in the morning and has to use the bathroom. All right, it has me quoting scripture. I'm outside with the dog saying, love is patient, love is kind, but dog, you're about to make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. But uh, that's our family. I'm also really excited because my dad is with me right here on the front row. Dad, will you wave? It's my dad, Pastor Reverend Bishop Tory Heron, and uh, I'm super honored that he's here as well as my best friend Connor on the front row right over here, and uh, really excited they're with me. But let's go to Matthew chapter 14. If you got your Bibles, turn them on. Let's go to Matthew 14. Here's the thing. Hey, listen to me real quick. Listen to me real quick. I promise you that what we are going to talk about tonight can change your life. I, I really mean it. It can change your life, but it's only going to happen if you lean in and if you listen. So I know we got some side conversations going on, and I get it because I was the side conversation king when I was in youth group. But I promise you tonight is not the night to have side conversations when Jesus is trying to talk to you. So let's lean in. Matthew chapter 14. All right, you can say amen as I'm preaching. You can say hallelujah. You can say preach it white boy. I don't care. You can say whatever. As long as you're responding, hey, as long as you're responding to God's word, 
and not talking to other people. Okay, if you hear something you don't like, I want to hear from you too. You can email me. You can email me at landonhairgrove at gmail.com. And I'll respond to all of it. I'll respond to all of it. So here we go. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. This is what it says. Are you ready? Here we go. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it's I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked to him on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I want to talk to you tonight. The title of my message is Came Through Dripping. Came Through Dripping. Why don't you just say that one time? Ready? One, two, three. Let's just say it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much. God, thank you so much for these moments. God, we know that you're in the room, and so we are welcoming you to speak to us now. God, we want to hear from from you. We didn't come for any other reason but you. We want to know you. We want to feel you, not hype, but you. We love you. We thank you so much for Chick-fil-A, and everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Hey, um, have you ever, have you ever, like, you you saw a situation, and you thought you knew how it was going to play out in your mind, and then it played out a completely different way? Has this ever happened to you? Let me tell you about a time that this happened to me. I was in the 11th grade, and in the 11th grade, I thought I was really cool. And I was sitting in recent American history class, and all of a sudden the door swung open, and there she was. I knew in that moment that this was my Mrs. Wright, that this was going to be my Beyonce that sang Hillsong music, that this was going to be my bae. I knew that I don't know where the lights came from. Lights started shining. Okay, Justin Bieber started singing in the background like my heart was beating. I was like, I don't know who this girl is, but I'm about to, okay? I I could see the wedding already happening in my mind. And and as she walked in the door, I promise you, I thought that she looked at me, and I was like, oh, it's on? (laughs) Okay, this girl, she walks in, and and she starts talking to my teacher. She says, hey, this is my first day. I'm a transfer student. My name is Kelsey, and I'm new to the class. And she hands him a piece of paper. My teacher, Coach Chambers, he starts looking around the room, for an empty desk, and by the grace of God, there was one empty desk in the entire classroom, and it was right next to your boy. Come on, somebody. Hey, hey, listen, I looked up, I looked up at God, and I said, God, I knew you were a good guy, but I did not know that you were a good wingman. Come on, somebody. So she sits down, and we're, we're going throughout the semester, and I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was spitting mad game. I'm spitting mad game. Like, like this was absolute incredible game spitting that was going on in seventh period of American history class. Okay, we're passing notes, all right? Like, like I'm reading these notes, and I'm like, there's no way that she does not love me. Like, this is real notebook stuff right here, okay? And so the semester gets on, and, and a couple months go by, and one day she passes me a note, and this is what it says. It says, do you want to go to Dairy Queen after school today? I said, this is my moment. I said, this is my moment. So I wrote back. I said, fine. <laughs> I said, fine. I was playing it cool. I was playing it cool. So we go to Dairy Queen. All right, here's the moment. Are you ready? We're sitting at Dairy Queen. She's got a large Reese's Cup blizzard. I've got a large Reese's Cup blizzard. The presence of the Lord was in that booth. 
We're sitting there. She's looking at me. I'm looking at the Reese's Cup blizzard. And she says, Noah, she says, I've been wanting to tell you something for a really long time. I was like, she said, it's just, I've been getting so nervous. I was like, it's okay, girl. It's okay. You can tell me. You just, just spill your heart out. It's all good. She said, I've been wanting to tell you something for a really long time. I'm just nervous and I don't really know how to say it. I'm like, you can just tell me. You can just tell me. And she goes, okay, I'm just going to tell you. I've got a crush on your best friend, Dylan. Welcome to my life. Welcome to my life. Why are we talking about this story tonight? What does it have to do with Jesus? What does it have to do with Matthew chapter 14? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I was focusing on the wrong thing in my relationship with Kelsey. And it made me think something that wasn't actually true. It made me do things that weren't actually reality. Okay, here's the thing. We read this this verse of scripture where Peter walks on water and then he falls in the water. He loses his faith. And if you're like me, you read this and you go, come on, Peter. How could you do this? How could you possibly blow it? You were walking on water. You were moonwalking on the waves and then you blew it in one moment. But the reality is Peter made a mistake that you and I make all the time. His mistake was that he was focusing on the wrong thing. How many times do we do this? We focus on our situation instead of our Savior. We focus on on trying to figure out how to build up our life instead of going to the one who gives us life. We try to make a way instead of going to the way maker. We try to do all these different things, focusing on all the wrong things when Jesus is right in front of us telling us to take another step. Now, we have to give Peter a little bit of credit because what Jesus asked Peter to do is a scary thing. Okay, this is a scary thing. This was not the the wave pool at Disney World that Jesus said, come to me. Okay, this is an ocean. This is, these are waves that are so big, that are so scary, that it is literally causing grown fishermen to cry like little babies. Okay, they are terrified for their lives. So this is a scary thing. Now, Follow me because this part of the story confused me because I've read my Bible and I know that my Bible says that God has not given me a spirit of fear, right? That's in there, right? Have you seen this? Raise your hand if you've read this. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So why then would Jesus Christ ask Peter to do something that is scary? If God hasn't given us a spirit of fear... Why does he ask us to do things that sometimes cause fear to show up in our life? I believe it's because there's a difference between a spirit of fear and the feeling of fear. See, the spirit of fear is when you let fear tell you how to think. It's when you let fear tell you what to believe. It's when you let fear tell you how to live. It's when you let fear win in your life. But the feeling of fear... That's an opportunity for faith to rise up and win in your life. That's an opportunity for you to trust Jesus with something that you don't know the ending of and to watch him show up and do what only he can do. Let me say this to you. What do you need faith for if you never felt fear? Why would you even need it? If you knew how everything was going to end, if you knew how your life was going to go the next four years of high school and and into college, if you knew who you were going to marry, if you knew how it was going to all shake out, if you knew what job you were going to work one day, if you knew the answers to all life's toughest questions, what would you need to have faith for? So when fear comes into our life, instead of getting upset, we should rejoice because we get to put our trust in a savior who promises to show up. Let me put it to you this way. Um, my wife is really, really good at shopping at Target. Do you guys have Targets in Colorado? Okay, she calls it Target. 
Okay, I think you have to spend a certain amount of money at Target for it to become Target. But <clears throat> my wife has definitely done that. So if my wife came to me and she said, hey, babe, I want to teach you how to shop at Target. It would take very little faith for me to, to believe her because I've seen it. Like I've seen her do it. I, I would just be like, okay, you're really good at this. I'll just follow your lead, right? But if my wife came into the kitchen and said, hey, I want you to try this new chicken recipe, okay, that would take a little bit of faith. You haven't seen the things I've seen in that crock pot. You haven't smelled the smells I've smelled from that oven. Okay, my wife has a lot of giftings, but cooking is not currently one of them. That would take a little bit more faith. It would take a little bit more faith. If you don't feel fear, what do you need faith for. The reality is this, God will always ask us to do scary things. He will always ask us to do or, or go to scary places, but he will never ask us to do scary things or go scary places alone. He promises to go with us, before us, behind us, around us. He is with us from the beginning until the end. One time I heard a teacher, uh, a preacher, he said this, he said, God test us to see if he can trust us. And he was talking about this passage of scripture. And, and that line is really catchy. God test us to see if he can trust us. But I was standing in the back of the room and I, I thought, you know what? I don't know if that's really true. I don't know if God tests us to see if he can trust us. Because a good teacher, always t he always teaches the lesson before he gives you the test. Right? What we have to understand about this passage of scripture, when Peter walks to Jesus on the water is that right before this, Jesus is sitting on a hillside with his disciples. And three or four or 5,000 other people show up and they get hungry. And they say, hey, where's the food at? And, and the disciples are like, we don't have enough food. There's no food. All we've got is this little kid's fish sticks and Texas toast. What are we going to do? How are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus goes, bring it to me. And he takes the Texas toast, and he takes the fish sticks, and he dips it in some marinara sauce, and he dips it in some tartar sauce, and all of a sudden he breaks it, and it feeds thousands of people. You know what Jesus was doing? He was teaching the lesson that even when things look like they're not going your way, if you will put your trust in Jesus, he will do the impossible. So when we get a few verses later to Matthew chapter 14, Verse 22, and Jesus says, come to me on the water. He was not testing Peter to see if he could trust him. He was trusting Peter with what he had just taught him. So tonight, if you feel fear in an area of your life, can I encourage you? It's because God already trusts you. That he already trusts you to put your faith in him anyways. That he already trusts you to keep showing up to youth group and serving anyways. That he already trusts you to keep praying for your lost family member. That he already trusts you to keep believing in a God who's still doing miracles. If you feel fear tonight, God, te God trusts you. He trusts you. He's teaching you. He's, he's trusting you with what he's taught you. Now, this is hard. I get it. Fear is not an easy thing to deal with. Um, the water... And this story in Matthew 14 represented Peter's fear. And in my life, there was a time when water represented fear uh, in my life. And it was a time when I went to Disney World. They have a water park called uh, Blizzard Beach. Has anyone heard of Blizzard Beach? We got any Mickey Mouse fans in the room? Let me just hear you one time. One, two, three. So my family, we go to Blizzard Beach. We go to Blizzard Beach. And uh, we walk in, I'm about six or seven years old, and there's a water slide at Blizzard Beach called Summit Plummet, okay? It made my stomach plummet. That's what it did. It was a 160-foot water slide straight down, okay, terrifying. You would, you would go so fast on this water slide that they literally measured your speed going down the slide. I'm six years old. We walk into the park. My dad, who's sitting on the front row over here, he looks at his six-year-old son and he goes, Noah, you want to ride that ride? I was like, not today, Satan. <laughs> all throughout the day, my dad's a daredevil. And so all throughout the day, he's like, hey, hey, Noah, you want to ride Summit Plummet? You want to ride Summit Plummet? I'm like, nope, 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 nope. We get to the end of the day. My dad goes, I'll give you $20 to ride Summit Plummet. Now, 
at a young age, at a young age, I was all about those Benjamins. So I stuck my hand in my pocket. I looked right back at my dad and I said, make it 40. <laughs> we get to the top of this water slide. We are so high. Like we're making friends with the seagulls. Okay. This thing is moving back and forth like this. And we're up there. And, and my dad, he walks over to the lifeguard at the top of the ride. He walks over and he whispers something in the lifeguard's ear. And I'm like, oh, this is weird. My dad knows the lifeguard, you know? And my dad, he turns around, he goes, see you at the bottom, jumps on the slide, goes down, leaves his six-year-old son at the top of the water slide. Okay, this is, you would go to jail for this in 2021. Let me just say that. We're going to have an altar call. My dad's going to come down in just a few minutes. But he goes down the slide, lights start flashing, sirens start going off. Guess what? My dad went 72 miles per hour down the water slide. He set the record for fastest person down the slide, not for the day, not for the week, but for the entire month of that calendar month at Summit Plummet. And he left his six-year-old at the top of the slide. One tear was just right down my face as I sat at the top of the slide. I'm sitting there. I'm repenting of all my sins. I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart. And all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, someone pushes me from behind. Yeah, my dad, my dad told the lifeguard, he said, my son is never going to come down this slide on his own. I give you verbal permission to push him down the water slide when I go down. Amazing. Amazing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about that trip. We went to several other parks at Disney World that week several other parks. And every time we would walk into the park, a new park, Magic Kingdom or whatever, my dad would pick out the biggest ride in the park and he would say, do you want to go ride that one? And for a second, that same sense of fear would rise up inside of me. And then my dad would go, remember Summit Plummet? If you could do Summit Plummet, you can do Space Mountain. If you, can do, if you can do Summit Plummet, you, you can do Splash Mountain. Listen, it works the same way with God. When fear shows up in our life, when anxiety shows up in our life, and we're like, how in the world am I going to make it through this impossible situation? God shows up and says, remember yesterday when I was good? Remember the day before when I was good? Remember the day before when I was faithful? Remember the day before when I showed up when you didn't think I was going to? This is the God that we serve. When fear shows up, if you put your trust in Jesus, he will show up every time. He will show up every single time. What does this have to do with us in 2021? Well, Peter, what he decided to do is he decided to come through dripping. He was standing on the thing that was causing him the most fear. Right? The water caused fear in Peter's life. He starts to walk on it, and the thing causing him fear begins to get on him. This tells me, as a follower of Jesus, sometimes we're going to have to follow him scared. We're going to have to follow him wet. We're going to have to follow him not knowing how it's going to end up. Maybe for some of you, this past year was really hard. You weren't sure how you were going to make it, how, how you were going to come through dripping. Man, how'd you keep your faith in the middle of a pandemic? Heard someone say that one time. How'd you keep your faith in the middle of a pandemic? How'd you keep trust in Jesus when all these bad things were happening around our world and our country? How'd you keep your faith? I came through dripping. I came through dripping. I, I just kept my eyes on Jesus and kept taking one more step and one more step, I kept believing that even though it seemed like it was all bad, that he was still working it for my good, that he was still being faithful to me and my family, that he still had a plan and a purpose. How'd you, how'd you keep your faith when your senior year stuff got messed up? When all the stuff got canceled at, at school? When, when all the stuff got limited capacity and you had to wear masks at all your senior year events? How, how'd you keep your faith? How'd you keep your, your joy? I came through dripping. I kept my eyes on Jesus. I remembered that it wasn't those things that gave me my joy in the first place. It was a God who gave me my joy. I came through dripping. I, I came through with an attitude of saying this is still going to be good. That God is still going to do something great in this year. That God is still going to show up in this year. How would you keep your faith when you were the only person in your house following Jesus? 
How'd you keep your faith when your parents had to drop you off at church and wouldn't come in with you on Sunday morning because they didn't, they didn't want to hear about Jesus? How'd you keep your faith knowing that you might be the only one in your family going to heaven? How'd you keep your faith? Now, sometimes it was hard. Sometimes I, I stay up at night, I think about where my family's going to spend eternity. Sometimes I, I look around at the other people at Res Youth and I see how they go to church with their family on Sundays and their parents drop them off on Tuesday night and come in and serve and my parents just bounce because they want nothing to do with it. But, but you, know what I, you know what I did? I, I kept worshiping. I kept praying. I kept believing. I'm going to keep singing. I'm going to keep asking God to move until every single one of my family members knows Jesus, until every single person in my house starts coming with me to Res Church. I'm going to show up. I'm going to come through dripping. You know, this, this past year, it, it felt like a battle. It felt like a battle, right? I, 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 I'm going to speak for me. It felt like a battle. And as I was praying for this night, I had that thought back, backstage in the green room that, that this past year, for a lot of you, was, was like me. It, was, it felt like a battle. And the Holy Spirit said to me, if you knew the size of my plans, you'd understand the size of this battle. If you knew the size of my plans, you'd understand the size of the battle. What you got to understand is that there's a real devil who wants to take you out while you're young. He wants to take you out because he knows that if you start to follow Jesus, it's not just going to affect you. It's going to affect your friends. It's going to affect your parents. It's going to affect your siblings. It could affect an entire generation of people if you decide to, to commit and be a follower of Jesus. So what he wants to do is throw fear and anxiety at your life in spades so it feels like Jesus is far from you and so that it feels like you have hit rock bottom. But can I just tell you from experience that when you feel like you've hit rock bottom, you will find out that Jesus can be your rock at the bottom, that in that place he will show up, he will speak into you, he will be faithful, he will surround you with his peace that surpasses all understanding, he will give you joy that does not come from circumstances but comes from an eternal father, he will give you things and meet you in a place that feels like rock bottom and you will realize that there is no such thing as rock bottom with Jesus. Because he's our prize. And he is good. I got a friend named Derek who's going to come up and help me. Where you at, Derek? Where you at? Y'all give it up for my friend Derek. Come on. Hey, I just want to say something real quick about Derek, all right? I've watched Derek since I got here this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Derek was here early. He was serving. The entire service, he's running around with a camera on. And I found out that this is not a one-time thing, that this dude literally shows up early each and every week to do this. All right? It's incredible. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Dude, I just want to tell you that God is going to bless that, man. That you sacrificing for your peers, showing up early, doing things that nobody sees, doing, doing things for people that they might not even know about the things that you're doing for them, God sees it. God knows it. He's going to honor it. And one day you're going to look back and people are going to say, Derek, how does God do all these amazing things in your life? Why has God put so much favor on your life? Why is God just moving through your life in the way that it is? And you can look back to eighth grade when you started saying yes to Jesus. One day after the next, one week after the next. Come on, give it up for Derek one more time. You want to hop in that pool? So this is what's going to happen. Derek is going to hop in this kiddie pool for me, all right? So he's going to be Peter. He's going to be Peter, and I'm going to be Jesus. He kind of got the short end of the stick a little bit, all right? But um, I'm the preacher, so I make the rules. Is it cold? It's a little cold. Okay. I'm just going to set this up for you. In the fresh res youth merch. <laughs> all right. All right, listen to me. Listen to me. So right over here, we got Peter, and he just fell. I want to read you the end of the story that we read at the beginning of this message one time. We're going to illustrate something, and then we're going to go back into worship, all right? This is what verse 32 says of Matthew chapter 14. This is right after 
Jesus picks Peter up out of the water. It says, they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. All right, I'm Jesus. This is Peter. Peter just fell and failed. Okay? Here comes Jesus, picks him up. Just stand right here and face, face everybody. Okay, here we go. The beginning of the story, what did the water represent in Matthew chapter 14? It represented fear. Fear. But the moment, the moment that Peter lost faith in Jesus, okay, follow me. This is, this is the only thing I want you to get this entire night. The moment Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he falls in the water, and the water no longer represents fear. It represents failure. It represents failure. This is the biggest failure that Peter has ever had in his entire life. Not only did he fail his Savior, but he literally failed his closest 11 friends. He did this in front of his best friends. He failed. Here's the question that I had as I was reading this passage of Scripture. If the water represented Peter's failure, when he got into the boat and began to worship Jesus, was he even dry yet? Was he even dry yet? Verse 32, it says that he got into the boat and everyone began to worship Jesus, saying, truly you are the Son of God. This says to me that right after Peter failed, his response was to immediately get back up and go to the feet of Jesus and begin to worship. Begin to worship. How many of you in this room have prayed prayers like, God, I want you to use me. God, I want you to use me. I want you to use me to be a light at my school. I want you to use me to reach people. God, I just want to be a walking, talking revival, share your love. And then you know what happens? Somebody shows up in our life that looks like Peter. They show up and they're not just a little bit wet with failure, but they're literally dripping on the floor with failure. And you know what happens? When that person walks in to res youth, when that person walks in to sit next to us at lunch, when that person walks into our life, if you're like me, you go, hey, man, Jesus loves you. But before you come up here, we got to dry you off a little bit. We got we to gotta get you right. We, we, you got to start worshiping like the rest of us. You got to start talking like the rest of us. You got to start looking like the rest of us. And so we put these towels on people and we say, hey, we're glad you're here, but there's always a but on the end of it. But wait, but, but, but you have to be like this, but you, you have to change this before you can come and experience this. How many times do we do the exact same thing? as followers of Jesus to ourselves. Right, some of you in this room, I, I know, you, you can laugh and, and you can talk the whole service, but I know that you're struggling behind the scenes. That you're addicted to pornography, nobody knows about it. I know because I was. Let's just call it what, it what it is. You're addicted to pornography, you got struggles that you are tired of carrying. And you know what you do? You come into church, res youth, week after week. You play the cool kid game. You're like, hey, everything's good. You put these towels over your head and you say, no, I'm good. I'm cool. And you play it off and you laugh about it, but it's killing you inside. And you cannot even worship Jesus the way that you are meant to worship because you are so weighed down with towels that you've put on yourself. And the lie that you keep believing is that you've got to dry off before you can come and have an encounter with Jesus. I want you to get back in the water one more time, Derek. I want to read you the scripture one more time. Verse 32. Verse 32. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is what you got to understand. The water represented fear, but then Peter falls, and it begins to represent failure. But the moment that Jesus picks Peter back up out of the water, the water takes on a third meaning. It goes from fear to failure to forgiveness. Check this scripture in Ephesians. Ephesians 1.7. In him 
we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to his riches and glory. So Jesus comes, he picks Peter up out of the water, and here's the moment, right? You just failed. You just sinned. You just had this this horrible mistake, this thing that you cannot stop doing. You've told God you're going to stop failing in that way over and over and over again. And here comes Jesus. You're at Res Youth. It's your night to have an encounter, but you feel like Jesus is showing up with towels. What I came to tell you tonight is Jesus has not shown up with a towel, that he's shown up with an embrace right here right here, that this moment between you and Jesus, that's what's going to make you dry. That's what's going to make you more like him. What the devil would have you believe is that you have to dry off before you come to Jesus. But what Jesus wants you to know is that you can come through dripping that you can come through dripping with failure, that you can come through dripping with fear, that you can come through dripping with sin. Did you know that in the book of Matthew, later in the book of Matthew, that uh, Matthew's gospel, Matthew eleven twenty eight, says that Jesus came to give your soul rest, that he came for the weak, the weary, and the burdened. So if you feel like you've got a whole bunch of failure and a whole bunch of fear in your life, let me give you a breaking news alert. It's exactly how Jesus expected you to come to him. Not completely dried off, not this perfect picture of a Christian, but as somebody who knows they're in desperate need of a savior. So maybe tonight it's time to stop putting towels on yourself and playing the game. Maybe it's time to stop putting yourself in a spiritual timeout and saying, I'll I'll go all in one day when I figure out how to recover from these failures. Maybe it's time to stop saying I'm going to take the week off when I feel like a hypocrite and I I didn't read my Bible. I'm going to skip small group this week because I didn't really live the best version of the Christian life. Maybe it's time to stop doing that. And when we fail, getting back to the only place where our hearts actually change, the presence of the one true living God. 